So, hey everyone, welcome to the Tory Birch Foundation webinar. Today, we're going to answer your questions on everything you need to know about the Economic Aid Acts, also known as the, the new updates to the stimulus bill. And I'm, I'm Gabrielle Raymond McGee, the Chief Operating Officer of the Tory Birch Foundation. I'm thrilled to be here with my friend, financial guru, Marilyn Landis. Marilyn has been with us before. She's authored a number of articles on our site about all the changes to PPP. So make sure you check out that information from Marilyn. And Marilyn is the president and CEO of Basic Business Concepts, which is an amazing company that's dedicated to providing affordable CFO level skills to small businesses. And she, as we were chatting, has read hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages of the government updates. And we're so grateful to her because she's going to tell us everything we need to know around updates for the PPP first draw and second draw, idle, employee retention tax credit funding, and live event grants, and much more. So Marilyn, we're so happy you're here. Marilyn's going to walk us through her presentation. And as you have questions, please type in the Q&A box below. We will do our very best to get to as many of your questions as possible at the end. And Marilyn, Welcome, thank you for being here and over to you. All righty, um, I need to get my screen share here. There's the button. Have I lost you? I'm, we're here, Marilyn. Okay, can you see my okay. screen share? We can't, not yet. Okay. Well, technology, here we go. Sorry. I am exp expert at some things, not everything. We'll take it away, Marilyn. All righty. <laughs> Sorry about that. Your slides. All righty. We'll get, get it going here. Yep. There we go. All right. And as Gabrielle had said, I do CFO, we provide CFO level services to small businesses literally all over the country. We have offices from Boston to San Francisco and everywhere in between. And why do I take the effort to read through all these uh, regulations? In my background, I spent 30 years as a commercial lender and a big chunk of that is an SBA lender. So I understand the world of lending and I understand the SBA. Also, I have a federal appointment to the National Regulatory Fairness Board under the National Ombudsman, which is a watchdog for small business to make sure that regulations are fair, fairly enforced and not overreaching. All of the above gave me an incentive to read, to read this and also to support my clients. But what I have found as we're reading through this and I told Gabrielle I would show this, we talk about all the regulations. Those are just the ones I have printed. Uh, so for those of you that feel like there's just too many rules out there and you're trying to understand what's going on, the important thing to keep in mind here is first decide what game you want to play, then learn the rules for that game. You can't learn all the rules and make sense of all of it. There is absolutely too much of it. So decide first what game you want to play. How do you decide? Well, first you decide what your business needs. Well, one year into COVID now, so do you have different customers now than you had before? Are, you, are they buying the same thing? Or are they seeking different products or services? How is your delivery of your product? Is it the same? Has it changed? Have, you, have the um, way your customers want to be treated changed? Have your suppliers changed? Have you been able to get the same products? So you, as you're weighing those things, you have three choices. One, you may need money to run your business the way it is, the way you've always run it and hope that when you stand it back up again, you're still on a main thoroughfare and that that line of business has not become a dead end street. So you're looking for money to run the business the way you always have. Two, instead you need dollars to pivot. You need to move to where your customers are now, to where the new market is, or to apply your skill set in a different way. Or three, you may need the dollars to open an entirely new business because when you currently have, you realize it doesn't seem to be the right choice to go forward. Well, the Relief Act carried money for the first two choices. If you want to 
fund your business to run it the way you've always done it. These will help you. If you want to uh, pivot into a new market, these can help. Unfortunately, there's really not much in this for brand new starting new businesses at this point uh, in, the, in the COVID whole environment of COVID. The Relief Act money there is for your first two choices. So let's talk about those. So we're gonna talk about IDLE, as Gabrielle had said, IDLE, the first draw PPP, the second draw PPP, and some other options that might be available, some grants and some tax credits. And what I'm gonna to try to do with each one of these is talk about the rules and the pro and con for each one of those. So you can decide which game you want to be in. Now there's a lot of information as I have mentioned with this. So what I'm gonna suggest we do is take a moment, give you a minute to read what's on the slide. To some of you, this may be familiar. You may have seen it many times before, so you'll read it quickly. For others, it may be the first time you've seen the information. So I'm gonna give you a minute to read it. And then what I'm gonna talk about is gonna reference the information that's on the slide. Let's talk a little bit about the idle loan. It's now open again for applications. SBA had run out of funding and it had closed. So it's now open and accepting idle loan applications until December 31st of this year, 2021, or until they run out of funds. So what's the pro? What's good about this program? The program works, really works well for companies that have no employees or only one or two employees. So if that's you, pay attention to these rules. This could be the game you wanna play. The con or the disadvantage is you don't get to request the loan amount. This is a direct loan from the SBA. So you supply information on the SBA website about what you need. It stands, the EDIL stands for Economic Injury Disaster Loan. So they'll review the information and they'll tell you what the maximum amount of the loan is that you can get. So pay special attention when you're filling that application out to what your revenue is, what your cost of goods sold. In other words, what you pay for subcontractors or supplies or materials to produce the good or service that you do. Take, be careful with that information. Nobody knows what black box the SBA is using for this underwriting, but it seems to be driven by the amount of your revenue and your cost of goods sold. So enter that into the application carefully. Now, another advantage as a pro, if you're applying for the first time, you will receive a $10,000 grant, whether you go further to secure a loan or not. That's really important for many small businesses. A $10,000 grant could be a game changer for them. That, and if you apply, you fill out the application and they'll notify you that you've been given a number, a loan number. Now the SBA is a little bit overwhelmed at the moment. So be patient. It'll take some time for this to get back uh, full circle around. But then they'll come back with another response saying, here's your loan number. We received the initial application. Now fill out for the loan. Go ahead and fill that information out. Uh, you may just, you can decide later whether you want the loan, the rest of the loan or not, but that $10,000 grant is yours. And as the slide says, if you'd have gotten an idle loan before and got less than the 10,000 grant, the new law put more money back in that pool and you can apply for the rest of the 10,000 that you did not receive before. Disadvantage is you're only eligible for this if you had a 30% decline in gross receipts. And that's government speak. Think of it as sales, all right, your top line revenue. If it had a decline between March of 2020 and December of 2020, 30% decline, and there's two caveats to this, and you're located in what's considered an underserved demographic market. These are challenged areas, either because of their economic status, uh, economic income, various, the easiest way to do it, there's a link at the end of my presentation. You can put your address into the government's new market tax credit site and see if you're in a qualified area. Uh, where you can be able to qualify for this. One of the advantages though with the idle loan is the grants and loan proceeds are not tied to payroll, unlike payroll protection, all right? They can be used for things other than payroll. So this is important for companies that don't have a lot of employees. You may wanna use it to rebuild, to pivot, to invest in a new business model, to pay vendors, or even to move your business slightly in a different direction so that you can recover with greater prosperity. The funds for idle can all be used for that. They're not restricted as they are for payroll protection. The disadvantage is, yes, the advance, the $10,000 advance does not have to be paid back, but the rest of the idle loan is a loan. Anything you get over and above that 10,000. 
If you accept the loan, it has to be repaid. However, the terms are very favorable. It's a 30 year payback at 3.75% interest and the first payment is not due for a year. No personal guarantees for loans under 200,000, no collateral. Uh, this is an excellent way for a small business to get funding right now. If, you fought, if your loan is for more than 25,000, they file what's called a lien against general business assets. Don't let that stop you. That's not a, a game changer for, for you. But one thing I will caution everyone on this, don't Google idle loans. I've had people do this. There's a lot of scams out there. Go to the SBA website, sba.gov, and go to the idle page to apply. The scams will want to charge you money to submit your idle, and they can't submit it for you. You have to do it. So for many, this may be the only game, particularly if you're a landlord. If your business is a landlord and you have no employees, you'll see as we go through the payroll protection, there's really nothing in that law that you can take advantage of. So this is the one you want to learn the rules for. The next one is the first draw of the payroll protection. Marilyn, we just have a few um, clarifying sure. questions for idle. Sure. So if you could go back to one slide, that would be sure. great. And I will try to hit that. And uh, we're getting a bit of feedback, I think, from your hands or paper close to the microphones. Let me move that. Thank you. Okay. Um, so a few questions. So if you already applied for idle mm -hmm. when it was first released, and you did receive an EIDL loan, can you apply again? There is a caveat in the EIDL program that does permit you to show greater economic need and therefore a need for more funding. They're not opening that right now. And I think it's because they're trying to get money to people who didn't get it the first time. Okay. And so a number of folks in our community applied before but didn't receive idle funding. So you're saying they should apply again, is correct. that correct? Correct, they should do two things. They applied the first time and they did not get the full $10,000 advance. They should go in and request the rest of the money because it's now funded for them to get that. Because the first law said they were entitled to 10,000 and then the SBA just ran out of money and it rationed it based on number of employees. So they could go in and do that. The second thing is they did not get the loan the first time and they have an economic need. Remember, it's an economic injury, so they have to be able to support that. Mm -hmm. But if they have had an economic injury, and most of the businesses have, then they can go in and request it now, yes. Got it, and Lauren is asking, she's a service provider, she doesn't sell product, and she wants to understand if she can apply for EIDL. My understanding is yes, but yes. let's know if that's... Yeah, and what she would, but for example, in my case, I deliver services and much of my services through subcontractors. So that's my cost of goods. So I would indicate that I've got my cost, what it costs me for every dollar I sell, how much I have to spend on those things to provide it. Um, so you have that opportunity, yes. Yes, the loan is not tied to be making a product. Great, and you said the deadline to apply for EIDL is December 31st of 2021, is that right? Correct. Correct. Um, but you're recommending people apply I would assume as, as soon as possible since there is a limited amount of money, is that right? Correct, there are already some pro some noises from some of the SBA programs, not this one, but some of them they're afraid of running out of money. So if they need, and if they need it, they should apply. And if uh, we have a few folks who applied for SBA loans that were mm -hmm. not idle, um, idle loans, but just SBA loans, they can still apply for idle. Correct. correct? correct. Okay. All right, I think that's everything. I'll let you get okay. to Okay, that's now. fine. All right, the next slide, this is really important. Take a minute to read the first couple paragraphs of this slide. This is very important. Why is this so important? When the first loans rolled out, they waived a lot of the standard SBA affiliation rules and there were problems. Um, many, many entrepreneurs have minority owners in their businesses and those minority owners may own other businesses. These may be people who helped you get started, made an investment, gave you some money to start your company and you gave them some 
ownership in your company in return. Many small businesses put together a mosaic of multiple small businesses they own to secure enough income for themselves. So let me highlight why this happened and why this is so important, why it was an important change. The why of this happened is the new law is stricter and the regulations are stricter because in June of 2020, the SBA's Office of Inspector General reported more than $402 million in the pay first round of payroll protection loans appear to have gone to businesses that were not in operation. So $402 million to businesses that weren't in operation. 11.7 billion in payroll protection loans appear to have exceeded the maximum loan amount. 355 businesses received payroll protection loans and had more than the 500 employees. So there was an extensive research done and Office of Inspector General made six recommendations to prevent money going to us outside the intent of the program and to go to the people it was intended for. These recommendations are all reflected in the new regulations. One of the key ones is bringing back the SBA affiliate rule, it's called, and enforcing it. So anyone you, you had to on the first round of applications list if you had any other, owned any other businesses, but they didn't enforce it, they didn't do anything with it. Now it's very significant that anyone who owns 20% or more of your business has to be listed. And if they own other businesses, that have to be listed. If you own other businesses that you have 20% or more ownership in, they all have to be aggregated together as a whole. So when you're looking, can I qualify to borrow money? Maybe you are a small business and you qualify, but somebody helped you out and you gave them 20 or 30% ownership in your company and they happen to own a big company that may make it you ineligible. Eligibility limits apply to the borrower and the sum of the affiliates. So keep that in mind when we're talking about size standards, revenue reduction, they're looking at you and then the aggregate of all of your affiliates, both foreign and domestic affiliates. Sorry, I'm having a little trouble with my controls. One thing that's important to you to keep in mind is the law, not the regulation, the law states lender held harmless, which puts the full weight of the law I knew the borrower that all the information is complete and correct. In an attempt to make sure that money goes to the right people and the people it was intended for, it's gonna make it a little more complicated uh, for those who wanna apply now. Unlike any loan you've ever applied for before, the lender is not responsible to do due diligence to make sure that your information is correct and that you qualify. I had one company say to me, oh, don't worry about it. My banker says it's okay. I said, that doesn't matter. You have to know it's okay. So beware of that, my banker said it's okay. The other thing to keep in mind too is because of this affiliation rule, if you had a payroll protection loan the first time, you may not be eligible the second time because the affiliate rule may or may not uh, make you too big or ineligible. The other thing that's new, this just came out January 15th and there's not much been said about this but it's impacting a lot of small businesses. I've been getting phone calls if you had the first payroll protection loan and that loan exceeded the maximum loan amount that the law permitted at that time, you're going to be required to pay, in, pay anything back over that maximum amount. Let me give you an example. I got a call from a woman in Ohio and she said, my bank got a hold of me and said that there, I got too much money. The, the calculation based on off the payroll was too high and I have to pay that back. She said, but I used it all on payroll. I used it all on payroll. I should be forgiven. Well, the law that came out January, the rule came out January 15th said no. And if you got more than the maximum amount that it, you, it will have to be paid back. That's unfortunate. So let's talk a little bit about these first draw loans. Let me let you get a chance to read some of the basic information on those. So if you did not have, have not applied before, the first time around you did not apply or get a payroll protection loan, you can now apply for the first time, first draw. And it's open, you're open to apply until March 31st of this year. The rules, uh, and that's the same for the second draw, that 
eligibility of the portal will close right now as of March 31st. Now the advantage to a first draw for those of you who did not take advantage of it before is if you didn't apply, you can't. And it's under the newer, under the new changes, which have some good things in them. The disadvantage is 60% of the money you borrow has to be used for payroll. And the maximum amount of the loan is based on payroll. So if you have no employees or you have only one or two, following the maximum loan rules may not give you the dollars you need. That's just a reality. You may need money for other things. And if it's limited to based on 60% has to be used on payroll, you, that may not be enough money for you and you can decide whether or not you even wanna to bother to apply. Now the rules for maximum draw are the same as they were before except the maximum draw is simply taking your average monthly payroll and for most businesses, it's multiplying by two and a half, which is about 10 weeks. For those that are in the hospitality industry and they're designated with a, what's called a NAICS code, North American Industry Code, that begins with a 7-2. They're allowed to take that average monthly payroll and multiply it times 3.5 for a larger amount. So those would be individuals who are, have payroll and they can base it off their average monthly payroll for either 19, full year 19 or full year 2020. If you are self-employed and have no employees, then your maximum loan is based off of your net profit. It's going to your Schedule C and looking at what your net profit is. And the disadvantage to that is if your profit is zero or below, there's no loan money for you, you're ineligible. If you have a profit, you can borrow two and a half times the average monthly. So you take your profit, divide it by 12, multiply it by two and a half. If however, you're self-employed, but you file what's called a schedule F, a farmer, a rancher raising, um, could be anything from fish to horses to produce, whatever. If you file schedule F, the law is new this time, you're able to take advantage of this by a, your gross income not your net profit, so that's new. One of the things I do suggest for the self-employed if you take advantage of this, keep in mind if you're multiplying by two and a half or three and a half times, let's take the two and a half to keep the math easy, that's 10 weeks. So if you have 10 weeks worth of money advanced and you have to use it for the eligible purposes, the new law lets you pick your covered period, unlike the first time it was around. So you can pick and say, well, if I'm borrowing for 10 weeks, I'm gonna pick 10, at least 10 weeks as my covered period so I can be sure I'm forgiven. Because what I'm borrowing against is what I'm gonna have the time to meet, which was a disadvantage in the first time around for self-employed. You got to borrow 10 weeks, but you only could qualify to be forgiven for eight, that was a problem. So this has solved that problem. The other thing to keep in mind is there are some broader definitions of what you're allowed to use for forgiveness this time. 60% has to go toward payroll, or in the case of the self-employed, has to go toward paying yourself, which is what they determine the net profit is. 40% can go for other things. And it can be things like putting protective barriers up in your establishment, um, adding a drive-through to it, buying an operating system so that you can do your business differently. A lot of expanded uses for the, the loan. The disadvantage for the self-employed is they can only claim those for forgiveness that are on their Schedule C as deductions. And that's an IRS rule. There's some things that the self-employed cannot deduct, that corporations can, vice versa. So you'd have to look at your Schedule C to see what those other expenses that you would qualify for. I mentioned before that the, one of the changes to the payroll protection is you can use the average payroll for either 2019 or 2020. Use that as your reference period. Your documentation is going to be all the payroll records that support that. Now note the disadvantage if you're self-employed and you have owner and you have employees, all right, then you would have a double calculation. You would take the payroll, come up with an average payroll times two and a half or three and a half for a restaurant, for example. And then you would take your net profit and divide it by 12 times two and a half or three and a half and add those two together. However, there are certain things that you cannot use when you're adding in the payroll if any of your employees own 5% or more of your company. Uh, they're considered an owner. So you'll have to check those rules carefully. If this applies to you 
And if you have any employees with ownership, just take a little extra time to make sure you're getting your facts right. The other disadvantage is many of you may be sole practitioners, but you filed as an S corp or maybe even as a C corporation. You can only use payroll to employees and owners, payroll, not net profit. Many individuals, this is the difference between a C and an S corp, an S corporation, the net profit flows through under your personal tax return. So many business owners in the S say, well, I'm gonna take some of it as payroll, but I'm not gonna take all of it as payroll because then I don't have to pay payroll tax on it. So it's part of what I live on comes through to as my profit. The law doesn't let you use that profit if you're an S corp or a C corp. You can only use what you claim as payroll. So if you're an owner and you haven't been taking a payroll, you won't have anything to base a maximum loan amount on if you're filing an S or a C. The documentation is far more extensive. You're going to have to submit payroll records and tax returns. The other thing the self-employed have to do that no one else does, you have to submit documents showing that you really are self-employed. That might be your 1040 Schedule C, it might be a 1099. There's a long list of things that you have to pick from to prove that you are in fact self-employed. Remember, these new regs got tighter because of the people who the OIG, Office of Inspector General, felt should not have gotten the money the first time around. So keep in mind, why, what, one reason to why are we having to prove we're in business? Well, what the, the, the law, not the regs, the law says that you cannot get a payroll protection loan if you are permanently closed. In other words, if you permanently close your business, you can't borrow this money to reopen it. You can have temporarily closed. So what I've been advising anyone who asks me is when you apply, have a plan for reopening if you did temporarily close. So if you have no employees, you look at the profit on your Schedule C, or you look at the gross profit on your Schedule F, or if you have a partnership, you look at your K-1s. With employees, you look at all of those, plus you can add on a multiple of the average payroll that you've been paying uh, to your employees. If you're a nonprofit, you follow basically the same rules, except you're looking at the 990. And LLCs have a choice of filing as a corporation or a partnership. You follow whatever rule you file your tax return with. I think they thought they were making it easier by tying it directly to the tax return, but they've only made a lot of the regs more complex because they now read like tax return rules. Keep in mind too, and this is important, the employer portion of payroll tax is not eligible for calculating the maximum loan forgiveness. That was a big mistake that was made the first time around. Your employees have a withholding and then the employer pays a portion and usually about 10%. And that cannot be included. So it's it, if this is a good for you, you haven't done it before, think about it. This is a game you wanna learn the rules for. If you applied the first time, here's some unique, Yes. I have a few questions that we're sure. getting through. Um, so one question is, if you are not a permanent resident or US citizen, are there new rules that you can apply um, despite not being a US citizen or a permanent resident? Two important points, Gabrielle, you raised. One, the basic rule here is Everything is exactly the same as the first time payroll protection, unless it's specifically changed. And in this time, it notes that you cannot count, same as the first time, nothing changed on this. You cannot count employees who do not run, reside in the United States, even if they're a US citizen. Mm -hmm. um, you have to follow the rules for whether or not you are an eligible business owner with the proper documentation. So you'd have to go back to the original set of payroll protection rules, nothing changed there. Got it. Um, a few more. If Can you apply for PPP if you've also taken unemployment? In some states, yes. Okay. Um, you have to follow the rules of your state and what will qualify. There's nothing in this law that says, the, the difference is payroll protection is to protect the payroll. Unemployment says you have no employment, therefore no payroll. Mm -hmm. They're opposites. Now, some states have allowed a blend. So as a business owner could afford to pay themselves less, they could get some payroll, uh, some unemployment. Ohio is one of those states. Pennsylvania is not, it's a black and white. Mm -hmm. In fact, we can't get any unemployment as self-employed here, period, at all. Uh, so it depends on your state and you'll have to be presenting that 
So your unemployment would not count towards your payroll. But if you have employees and you've been making payroll and some of those folks have been out on unemployment, what you same rules as before, if they're coming back, you're gonna, that's why they allow you to use 2019 as a base payroll, because that's when you would have soon been at full employment. And someone specifically asking about 2019 versus 2020, they wanna know if they should use 2019 numbers since 2020 was mostly a bust for their business as an event planner. Um, what's your take on that? I, it falls into two buckets. In, in this particular person's case, where 2020 is not what they wanna be and they intend to go back to something, to, they wanna go back to 2019, they wanna use 2019. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I have some clients that when they automated to meet their customers' needs for more delivery online, all that sort of thing, they need less employees. So if they use 2019, they won't have enough for forgiveness in 2020 Got it. and 2021. So they are gonna base it on 2020 because they have intentionally changed their workforce. And a few more specific questions. Mm -hmm. if, if you're in the restaurant or hotel category that now gets 3.5 X mm -hmm. instead of 2.5 X, if you're receiving the PP, if you received the PPP in 2020, is there a way to receive the additional funds from that round where 2.5 was used to calculate, or is it only available for a PPP application done in the second draw for 2021? Yeah, if you've already received it, no. There's no additional money available. This is strictly for the second draw. Mm -hmm. Or if you're getting the first draw for the first time. And um, Janet wants to know, she's an LLC with employees. She pays herself and she gets a W-2. Am I also considered an employee or only those that don't have ownership in the business are employees? You, you all are receiving a payroll, whether you're an owner or not. That's the important distinction. You're all receiving payroll because you happen to also be an owner. There's a certain portion of the payroll contributions you will find ineligible when they're summing them up for the maximum payroll. There's some quirks there. They feel that there's uh, the unemployed, there's, there's math, there's a whole formula math in there to get you back to what the unemployment tax is. They've, they've made this like a tax return. Mm -hmm. But if, you, if the rules are determine how you file, and that's the piece of the world you want to check into just on yours. Because if you look at all of them, I showed the stack of paperworks. But your LLC, it would, it would follow the rules if you file as a corporation, which you must, if, you, if you're if you getting payroll, you must be filing as a corporation, as an S-Corp. So you follow the rules for the S-Corp. And I'm sure we'll get to a number of idle specific questions that are popping up in a, a little bit as well. Um, Everyone should know we will be circulating Maryland slides to your email later today. So be on the lookout for that. People are want to reread this. Um, and you'll also be able to watch this again on the Tory Birch Foundation YouTube channel. So know that you will have time to, to really marinate on all of these important questions. So Marilyn, take it away and let's okay. go through the second draw. Yeah, two points in here. One, I will admit, um, and the, they know this is Tory Birch. When you get my slides, all of my comments are in the comment section. It's more than just the pictures that you're seeing. And I'm gonna to apologize to everybody that I'm reading as much as I am. I normally don't read, I do my presentations this way, um, but there is just so much material and please forgive me and I'm going to read it. So on the second draw, the advantage, the pro here is you can get a second loan. That's really important. Uh, with the new enforcement of the fill it rule, as I said before, you may have qualified the first time and not qualify this time. The disadvantage is the rules for calculating the revenue, the maximum, uh, the revenue reduction, as this says, there has to be a 25% reduction in revenue. The rules for calculating that read like a tax return set of rules. Uh, they are really complex, but you can sift it down by only focusing in on what does my tax return look like? What form do I file? And that's the only piece of this game I have to learn the rules for. But an important definition here, and it's confused even longtime savvy business owners, the government in its infinite wisdom when it wrote the regs refers to gross receipts. That's not gross profit. What the government is calling gross receipts is what the rest of the world calls sales, revenue. Right? The definition for that, it's all your revenue on either a cash or accrual basis, depending on how you report it. It includes the sales of products and services, 
interest, dividends, rents, royalties, fees or commissions, investment income, net of any returns or allowances. What's excluded, and these are for the most part good exclusions, capital gains, taxes that you collect like sales tax that you have to collect on behalf of a taxing body and pass it through to somebody else. Those are excluded. Proceeds from transactions with domestic and foreign affiliates. If you've got things going back and forth with an affiliate company in another country, those are excluded. The amounts that, for example, travel agents, real estate agents, advertising agents, freight forwarders would collect from a customer to pass through to another entity, those are excluded. And of course, any funding you got on a first payroll protection is excluded. That's not considered part of income. But the disadvantage to this is it does include interest, dividends, rents. So if, for example, a company, your, your business is you're, you're dwindling, all right? So you've got excess space. And somebody approaches you and says, you know what, we need a distribution hub right here. Can we sublease a piece of your building so that we can do that? And you say, great. And that helped you get through this. And that was wonderful, smart move on your part. However, two things on this, that rent will have to count as income. So you might not meet the 25% revenue reduction, A. B, when you go to file for forgiveness, the rent you're paying for that space, you'll have to pro rata out a piece to that subtenant you had, and that won't count. So in an attempt to clarify the 25% reduction rule, they're gonna make it for some of the survivors a little harder because what they survived on will be considered part of the income. The other thing you have is the rule. Uh, the rules basically for payroll protection are the same as they were for the um, first one, unless changed. Now keep in mind this 25% reduction that we said here applies to you, the borrower. It also has to apply to all of your affiliates were summed together. So you may have had a 50% reduction in your top line revenue, but you also own a company that had no reduction whatsoever. And when the two are brought together, you may or may not meet the 25% reduction rule. The other eligibility rule that many people who are applying already for the second draw are running into some problems with if you had a first payroll protection, obviously you did, or you wouldn't be doing a second one, and you've applied for forgiveness, if that's being held up anywhere for a review, it, the bankers are getting all kinds of cold codes, driving them crazy, because they're, they can't process anymore until they figure out what it's being held for. Second, the law, not the regulation, the law, requires that you have spent all of the money in the first draw on eligible forgivable expenses. So simply put, if you've used, you got a first payroll protection, you used it for good business purposes, but you chose to, they're just things you needed to spend it on and they weren't forgivable and you were gonna accept the fact that a part of that loan was gonna become a loan, that's fine. Except you won't qualify for the second draw if you have any portion of it that's not forgiven. One of the advantages though in this new law, which is great, is a new form for forgiveness. This is what's different this time around. They gave us the forgiveness rules at the same time they gave us the application rules. Form 3508S, and this is in my notes, for loan amounts under 150,000. If you can use it, use it. It's much simpler. You simply certify that you've used the proceeds all for eligible, the minimum payroll, you've done the correct calculation and documentation of the revenue reduction, and the um, your owner's compensation was capped at 100,000 that you didn't spend more than that. And that's across all the companies you have ownership in, 5% or more, that you didn't make get more than 100,000. And you meet two safe harbors, no reduction in employees or salaries, or there was a reduction, but it was caused by COVID restrictions that forced you to close or partially close. You're not required to show your calculations for the employees. There's no full-time equivalent test. You can certify, if you can certify the boxes, you're done. So that they truly did come up with a much simpler um, application for loans under 150,000. And the world really will end when the hot dogs and the buns come out even. Uh, so let's talk about some of the loose ends that kind of make, make it whole for some of the others. And these are some other little side games, but they may be the most important one for you. One is grants. The new law offers two grants. 
One of them is for live venue grants. If you qualify, this may be what you're looking for because it's not based on payroll. And it's not limited to, you know, the misconception is it's limited to live theater. It's not. It, the definition includes companies that are operators or promoters of theatrical productions, museum operators, motion picture operators, talent representatives. The intent is to provide money to that entire industry. And the law, the regulations are written with very specific, and the law, very specific restrictions to make sure that these are really full-time live venue. It's not a bar who happens to have a singer come in once every other Friday night. It's not a place that has a lobby and once a quarter they hang some art in it. No, these are meant to be professional in the uh, live venue. The advantage is that you can apply for up to 45% of your gross earned revenue. So this can be a significant gain for somebody in that industry. You cannot have, however, both the payroll protection and the venue grant. So if you are a live venue, you wanna check that out first see if you qualify for it, what the amount of funds would be, and then compare that against what two and a half times or three and a half times your payroll might be. The other grant is called the transportation grant. And this is for bus companies, ships, passenger, transport services, think of buses, think of ferries, anything in the passenger transport area can qualify for this grant. And they can also have a payroll protection at the same time. So they can get both. Um, the disadvantage is you can't add, you can have payroll protection, you can have this grant. And if you benefit from anything else that's out there in the COVID relief packages, you cannot get more than the total of your revenue. That's not a bad regulation, that's kind of fair. So those, those are two grants. If you're in those industries, check them out. They could be the game for you. Lastly, we did a little reference to the employee refund, the, uh, Employee refundable tax credit, you have to have employees to qualify for this. And you probably want to have more than one or it might not make sense for you. But you can get a refundable tax credit that could be as much as $14,000 per employee over the first two quarters of this year. So, and you would apply for this through your payroll, whoever used to process your payroll, because when they file your quarterly payroll reports, they'll file this application for this, you know, that'll cover your employer portion of the payroll tax. And what you don't use, you get refunded back to you as cash. So this could be significant. Uh, you get quarter one in 2021, quarter two, but you cannot use the same payroll for both tax credit and payroll protection. So clients who are interested in the tax credit, I'm telling them, look into it. They can apply for the first quarter, the second quarter, and then apply for their payroll protection loan, the very first part of March, so they'll be using March and April payroll and not doubling up in the same payroll. These are the links I promised. If you wanna know if you qualify for an EIDL loan and if you're in one of the economically challenged areas, it's a census tract, you can go to this website, put in your address and it'll let you know if you're in a qualified zone. I happen to be in a, a hub zone and it was, falls within a census tract, it's qualified. And so therefore I am qualified. The other piece, and I've had a lot of questions over this, is many, the, the law, the publicity around the law said there was gonna be a set aside for veterans, women, minorities, economically challenged neighborhoods. And people said, well, my bank's not giving me any priority. This isn't working. Well, the problem was the law did not make the set aside to the business, the set aside is to the lender. So there was money and time and effort set aside for those lenders who specialize in the, uh, underserved markets, minorities, women-owned businesses, veterans, and so forth. So you may or may not, if you bank with PNC or Chase, you may still be waiting for somebody to pay attention to you. This program, the SBA Lender Match Portal, has been around for several years. You can go in and put in your information, and SBA, not a broker, this is SBA, will send it out to all of their approved SBA lenders and see if anyone is interested in taking the loan. Where this is important is many small businesses particularly minority businesses who were not banking with a big bank or had no big bank relationship are finding it very difficult to get someone to take their application for either the first or the second payroll protection because the big banks are saying, well, unless you have an established account with us and part of that's being caused by 
a rule SBA put out, meaning to help people, but it's made it harder, saying to the banks, if somebody recently opens an account and then immediately applies for a payroll protection, you have to report them to us as potential fraud. So the banks are scared of this stuff. So this is one way to get matched up with a lender who says, I'm willing to do 50,000 and I don't care if you live in Iowa and we have an office in San Diego, that's okay. We're set up to do that and we'll process the loan. The other thing just before I close, as far as that last little pieces where the hot dogs can match the buns, if you have an existing SBA loan, you probably have already benefited from the SBA making six months worth of payments for you. And for many people that enabled them to survive getting through this period, you are now eligible under the new law for three more payments. Um, so as long as the SBA funding holds out. So if you've not heard from your lender, you should check with them if you're coming to the end of that six months that you had qualified. And with that, Gabrielle, I'm open for questions. Thank you so much, Marilyn. This has been great. Um, Atina is asking specifically the extra money to underserved communities, whether that be women, minority, disadvantaged populations, that extra money through the lenders, is that that's only through PPP, not through EIDL and not through the employee retention tax credit. Is that correct? First correction, there was no extra money. Okay, there was no extra money. There was a pool of money. And the idea was if that could, the fund could not be depleted down to zero like it was the first time, mm -hmm. unless this group of people got that much money. If they don't take it, then that's available for other people. All right. By the certain deadline or what? Well, they didn't make that clear. Okay, <laughs> got it. All right, it was well intended, but mm -hmm. I'm not sure how well it's worked. Uh, I had one very tiny credit union call and say, our members so badly want us to take this. How long does it take to get qualified with SBA? Ouch. You know, that's tough. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm getting calls. As I said, I'm also on the Regulatory Fairness Board and we're reporting a lot of this up to the regulatory body. I chair the, uh, the working group on access to capital. And we're running this up through them because some of the banks are saying, well, you don't just, can't just open an account with us. You have to commit to a long-term relationship with us. Mm. Well, nothing in the rules say that. So we're pushing back against some of those things. But the trick is to find a lender who, if you qualify for the set aside, find a lender who specializes in that. And there are maps through the government, um, much like the one I found for the new market tax credits, where you can search for those lenders, whether it's an economic development group, a local microloan, a CDFI, whoever it happens to be. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I will say it's helpful to understand that the focus of underserved communities is really through that lender. And right. so that link that you provided that will be in um, the deck and the slides, that right. will be very useful for opening your mind and um, being more aware of lenders that maybe weren't on your radar in the first round, right? Right. And the second part of your question was about EIDL. Yes. The, the intent of the EIDL loan was to get it first to the underserved markets, those who had not had access to it before. Mm -hmm. And those that I have talked to who have actually gone in to apply, get back and say, well, I, they say I have to wait until whatever this fancy wording is. And I said, because SBA is sorting that out. They're trying to give priority. You have to be in an underserved market to start with. That's the first way. So the idle loan is not available to people who are in a high wealth demographic. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean where you live. It means where your business is. So the, it, the intent is to do that automatically by saying you have to be in an underserved market, but they are trying to make sure that they're getting to people who didn't get it before. For the first priority according to the law is to fill out the rest of the grants that people didn't get all that they were supposed to get. Mm -hmm. And the second priority then is to make sure everybody in the underserved markets gets access. And since the SBA is a lender, you don't have a bank problem with that. And so to be clear for everyone, EIDL is through SBA. Correct. PPP is through a lender, and that could be a, a bank, credit union, CDFI. FinTech, online FinTech, lenders. Women business right. centers, some of them. Right. And then the employee retention tax credit, who is that through? That's actually through the IRS. Okay. But the way the portal you access it through is through your payroll processing group. They will file the request at the same time they file your quarterly payroll tax reports for you. Okay, great. And there are so many new businesses in our community, which I love to see. 
um, but explain to us the framework around new businesses applying for PPP, if they even can apply for PPP, what are the dates and, and framework around that? This time the law said you had to be in business on February 15th of 2020. So if the business has been started since February 15th of 2020, this is not the game you get to play. If you have started, there are pieces of the rules that permit you to not have to use full year measures of tax returns, full years measure of payroll. They will, there are, and we could talk all day if I went into all the nuances, but they're there to permit those who were open on February 15th of 2020 to be able to meet the criteria and alternative documentation they can supply. If for example, you haven't filed your 2020 tax return yet, you can bring down the 2020 tax return put your information in it, and that's what you submit saying, this is what I will file, even if you haven't filed it yet. So there was an attempt, but the cutoff is February 15th of 2020. Okay. And Krishan is asking, um, I did apply for the second draw, but they approved me for an amount that does not cover one month's payroll. Is there a workaround in this case, or should I just accept the lower amount? What? advice do you have there? I would take a look at the information you submitted to them because they should have taken your average monthly payroll times two and a half. If your payroll now is significantly greater than it was in 19 or 20, that would result in a lower payroll amount calculation, but they should take your average payroll times two and a half or three and a half. So go back to them and ask to revisit the paperwork that you submitted to them. They didn't get enough information to give you more. It should be your average payroll of 19 or 20 times two and a half. Got it. And, and with the updates for the, the second draw, it certainly seems like there's more scrutin scrutiny around the documents you're submitting, that your ducks and documents need to be in, in a row. What else should people be thinking through to make sure that they're protected and in, in doing this in the proper way um, to mitigate any risk? I cannot stress this enough. Going in the first time, many of my people I talked to said, well, I got to get the money. They were in such a rush to get the money and I got to get it before and it won't make a difference. And who's going to care if I'm off a little bit? Mm -hmm. Well, you already saw where January 15th this year, they're going to claw back money they gave you a year ago. Because mm -hmm. even if the borrower, even if the bank made the mistake and gave you too much, they're going to claw it back. What's happened is everybody's read the press. We know there's been a lot of people that people are upset got the money. And the kickback against that has been fast and furious. And we're seeing the brunt of it. So in an attempt to get money out to people they want to get it to this time, the restrictions are in some cases making it harder. So don't be afraid of it, but be sure you've done your calculation. You keep all the document. If you go for an idle loan, spend some time to write down what your, your defense is for being an economically injured business. Like I looked at myself and I said, I, I think it's going to take me six months to get back up to speed because some of my clients are having trouble paying me. So about six months. And how much do I think I'll be short for six months? And that's what I applied for for the idol. And it was less than they offered me because I could support that amount. Mm -hmm. Keep your records. And because one of the things that again is different with this and they are already starting, unfortunately, going after people, but you're certifying, read those certifications that you sign in the application very carefully. If you have a question, check with a professional, whether it's your CPA, whether it's a me, whether it's an attorney, somebody, but, but don't fall for scams. Please, please, please be careful of that. But take a look at it and make sure because there's some pretty stiff federal penalties if you lie. If you make an honest mistake, you've got your defense. Here's my paperwork. Mm -hmm. You know, this is what I, and the SBA doesn't really want you using professionals to prepare this stuff for you because they want an honest answer from you but they're putting you in that box. I said, I had one client that uh, just Googled idle. She called me and she said, this doesn't look right. And I said, this is not right. Don't, go, don't fall for it. Go directly to the SBAs. So be sure anything you're searching, make sure the answer that comes back on Google is either .gov, mm -hmm. all right? It's either sba.gov or it's treasury.gov or it's irs.gov. If it's not, don't respond. So be aware of fraud for sure. Um, and then we have people asking if they should be applying with multiple lenders for PPP. 
what's your advice on that? Um, I know we've, we've had so many people that were frustrated of never hearing back when they've applied for PPP. Right. What, do you, what do you recommend there? The first time I said apply with more than one because everybody was scrambling and trying to figure out what they were doing. This time they've all had a chance. The lenders that are in this program have been in this program before. So if you're not getting a prompt response, consider the fact that you're not in their sweet spot. This, and some lenders are not participating this time. Mm -hmm. They've simply said, some of the lenders are under audits from SBA for what they did the first time, some big ones. So they're holding off even participating this time or our SBA is holding them off from participating. But the trouble is because the program is being trying to be pushed out to so many people so quickly, the person you're talking to probably doesn't know. I've had so many conversations with bankers when they'll say, well, that form's not available. And I'll say, be careful how you say that. I could go to the IRS website and bring it down right now. Mm -hmm. You may want to say the form's available, but not at our bank yet. So I would say talk to multiple lenders and decide which one you want to make an application with and make sure it's an appropriate one for you. Well, Marilyn, we're all so grateful to you for your, your sage advice, your know-how. We're reading through hundreds and hundreds of pages of the updates to this bill. And um, I'm sure we will be in touch with you, that we will rewatch this video and can't thank you enough. for No problem. I, I hope it's been helpful. I, I once told something like this is like trying to drink from a fire hose. And I apologize for the, the volume, but I didn't write this stuff. <laughs> We are deciphering it for all of us. And um, that's a great reminder. Marilyn, as I mentioned at the beginning, has been such a collaborator and, and author to so many of the articles on ToriBirchFoundation.org about this very topic of PPP, IDLE, updates, tax retention, et cetera. So be sure to read those articles that are available 24 seven. And um, Marilyn, thank you. I know sure. people will be reaching out to you left and right. Thank you. I enjoyed it.